Greetings and salutations. I hope your day is both tranquil and fulfilling. I am Athanasius, and welcome back to the podcast of the Boldly Immortal. Today, I'm actually going to keep going with that uh, that concept that I brought up two weeks ago. I still have that note card pile, and I've added a few things to it. And as I continue to refine that that process of, of keeping track of my thoughts... Um, I find more and more that I end up with harmonies that, that work really well. So uh, last week, admittedly, was a bit strange, uh, but it went a, it went in a good direction. I just wasn't expecting it. Uh, and this week, I think I found, well, I've been meditating on ideas that uh, I've been wanting to talk about for a while and trying to put them into practice in my own life. Uh, and the real, the real center of this would be rumination. Rumination. Um... I've talked in the past about the value of meat and how awesome it is. And part of the reason for that is, like, when you eat meat, you're eating something that's already multiple digested nutrients. The cow sits and eats food, and then it chews on it, and it and it just it just ruminates is the is the way we would describe it. It's a ruminant animal because it has multiple stomachs, so it eats it and it absorbs it in the first stomach, and then it goes into the second. And it sits around in there for a little while before it finally comes out the other end, um, what little remains. Uh, and then that ends up being good for the soil, which is fascinating. I mean, fascinating creatures these things are. And I mean, you really could not design a better, a better system. It's, it's, really, it's really fantastic. Cows are just glorious beings, um, as are sheep. You know, they're fantastic, fantastic. Um, but... I, I've been recently meditating on the idea of having a ruminant mind. A ruminant mind. And what would that mean? Right? When you watch a cow eating food, they're very, very slow. Very patient. Not that they could be, per se, patient as a virtue. Because they're cows. What else are they going to do but sit around and eat all day? That is what they do. And then sometimes they'll need to bring in more when they're hungry. But on the whole, they'll just sit there chewing. And they'll move around and chew some more. And and I've been thinking, isn't that a really good analogy for thinking? How people think and how we, you know, absorb information. And realistically, you have to, you have to let it sit. You have to kind of gnaw on it for a while. And you have to let it become a part of you in multiple different areas before you actually can uh, fully take advantage of that idea. And frankly, the better the idea is, the less you'll actually have to get rid of in the end. So if you're feeding yourself good ideas, if you're ruminating on really, really good, high-quality stuff, well, then that's going to maximize the amount that you're able to benefit from those ideas. This is one of the reasons why meditating on scripture is fantastic, because you're not going to find better meat than the meat of the scriptures for ruminating in your mind. Psalms and Proverbs, my friends, Psalms and Proverbs, you are speaking to the spokesman for the sons of Solomon, and I'm not going to not say, you know, don't read the Psalms. I'm not going to not say, read the Psalms. Uh, Read the Psalms, they're great. But in addition to that, think about all the other information you're taking in in your everyday life. I'm not saying the only thing you should ever read is the scriptures. Fatigue is a real thing. Information overload is a real thing. Frankly, if you spent all day reading the scriptures, you wouldn't you wouldn't remember half of it. More than half of it. You'd probably forget 90% and that the 10% that you did keep, you'd only partially value. If you only read 10% of that scripture, though, and you meditated on it all day long, how much more value would you be able to pull out of it? I mean, it's just simple. It's a very simple thought process. That the more you meditate on a specific thing, the more value you're able to get out of that specific thing. The more time you spend talking with a person, the better you'll be able to understand them and the more you'll care about them. The more... Uh, time you spend working on a skill, the better you will get at it. The more time you spend looking at something, the better you will understand it. 
ruminant activities where you stop and you let you let what you're doing be what you're doing are frankly the way that we get anywhere in understanding and it is our inability to pause i would argue as a society that is part of our well not our it is our society's inability to pause that will be their destruction and the reason I have to correct myself there is I've decided I don't belong to them. I don't belong to modern culture or secular American society. I am not a secular American. When I speak with uh, friends who are uh, not uh, Americans, right, who are from a different country, and they, you know, they're living here on a visa or they're, you know, here for for travel or, or you know, when I go overseas, they, they talk about America as as a certain set of values and frankly the values that they see for america i don't have i'm a christian and and what america is is a secular country and i frankly think that's going to be its own downfall you know, i intend to wage demographic warfare as best i can uh, because i think it's better for a society to have christians and to be christian but um yeah right now it's not the, it's not that's just not the case so we'll give it time. And in time, the whole system is going to self-destruct. Why? Because they don't slow down. And frankly, they can't. They can't slow down because they're eating garbage. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's one thing feeding the other. And if they were to slow down and become hungry, uh, they would realize how unsatisfying everything they have is. And so they would rather stay endlessly doped up, endlessly... You know, numbed to any real pain, numbed to any real reality, lest they should wake up and see where they actually are. That's that's the problem, though. That's a problem, and that is a a, a thing that we can fall into all too easily. The the soma, right? There's a great, there's a lot of great things in. Um, Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, but that is one of the best ideas, uh, that the way you keep a population in line is not 1984-style brainwashing, or at least not that only. But the better way to do it is to, arguably the better way to do it, is to give them a drug that makes them happy. And then if they were to abandon your system, they would have to engage with suffering. And their natural inclination to avoid suffering would keep them away from it. Now, there's a slight problem with that in that there are those who will suffer at all times. And then also there's those who will be stubborn. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's a real danger if, this, if our secular society ever wakes up to that reality and realizes the danger of those willing to suffer. Boy, that, that could be a problem if it doesn't integrate those people into the system. Those who are willing to die are a threat to those who are not willing to feel pain. And so how do you solve this in your, your own life? How do you escape the, the, the haste of the culture? What's going on there in the first place? And this is what I've been ruminating on myself, trying to, trying to think on what could, what could I do. I had a really great conversation with some friends yesterday where we were talking about some of these ideas, some other ideas as well, but, but this particularly struck me uh, that the, the piece that, that I found there came from how I was actually eating this past week. Usually, because I'm, I'm alone, I would pull up a YouTube video or a, you know something like that, like a movie or a TV show, and watch it while I'm eating my dinner. And that way I have some noise in the background. It makes me feel like I'm with other people. It's, it, was, it was enjoyable. Um, it was a good drug. It was a fantastic drug. But then I, I stopped doing that because I realized that I wanted to do more reading. And so I'm like, well, I only have a certain amount of time in the day. I guess I'm not doing anything else while I'm eating, so I might as well read. And this had an added benefit of encouraging me to use my knife and fork more uh, like a civilized human being. <laughs> So uh, that was good. But sitting and reading and eating food 
and, and, and the process of, of taking a bite and then chewing it for 30 seconds because I want to read and I want to have like some unbroken read. So I'm, I'm sitting there with a steak in front of me. I'm cutting this steak nice and slow and um, eating, eating really good food and reading the church fathers um, in the evenings with nothing in my ears but, but, the, but the silence around me um, and just embracing those words as they come off the page. Friend of mine, um, Brian, you might remember him from a couple years ago, had the insight that the written word is it, it requires more thought per per word than what we usually do. So right now, because everything I'm saying is off the cuff, there's less value per word. You're not going to appreciate it as much as if I wrote it down. You're not going to listen as carefully when you hear what I say, because it is hearing and not writing. And if you saw my face, you would res you would care even less because the value would be s dropped yet again. And so the, the video chat has the least thought, and then the phone call has a little bit more, because I have to, I have to express some things with my voice, and consequently there is some additional thought going into this. But if this were in writing, if this were in writing, it would require even more thought. Tone of voice would be absent. And, and so then when we read, we are reading things that matter and reading things that are 2,000 years old almost. I, I mean, there's some, there's some amazing value in that that I've gleaned. And to sit there and, and ruminate on it and let that be the word. Let that be enough. It's not a lot of words. I don't read terribly fast when I'm at dinner. But I take my time, and I'm there, and I'm not doing anything else, and it's quiet, peaceful, relaxing, entertaining even. Not entertaining as in my mind is being distracted, but, but entertaining as in like I'm actually being engaged. I'm enjoying myself in, the, in this engagement with something true. And so this entertainment is, is not merely temporal. I mean, it, this is this is good stuff. It's not just gonna stick with me. It's, it's gonna stick with me. It's not just gonna leave. I'm not eating sugar. I'm not eating carbs. I'm eating. I'm eating the pure meat. Um, as as uh, not directly from the scriptures in this case. I actually have a pretty good cook. Right? I've been reading Ignatius, and that man, that man knew how to write. Uh, and and yet and yet he's also oh he's also so beautifully human. The letters there are surprisingly natural. So when you see it, the epistle of so and so, and you actually read it, like hey, this is a letter that this guy wrote to somebody else. Man, it's it just opens the whole thing up in, in a beautiful, brilliant way. Um, so I've been doing that, and combining that with like the thought from Brian and, and a couple of thoughts from a couple other of my buddies, came up with this card. The more we force ourselves to consume, the less we can actually absorb. I was like, yeah, that seems, that seems about right. The less we force ourselves to consume, the less we actually can absorb. And, and this would mean then that, well, and I've already written this elsewhere, uh, silence is the key to communication. You can't have understanding if you're constantly surrounded with noise. Uh, it's a great, this is a great podcast, um, Stop the White Noise, coming out this, uh, this year from uh, Pastor Jonathan Fisk, so I highly recommend it, because frankly, that idea is good. When you're constantly surrounded with, you know, inputs, you can't think, you can't think. I was out today in, in, an extension of this thought, right? I've been eating and ruminating as I eat. Well, what if I go outside and I ruminate out there and I breathe in the air and try and embrace it? Well, I went out today and I've got this little forest, very small forest near my, near my apartment complex. So I went out there and I have found this, tr this particular tree that is big enough that it has cleared a little bit of an area around it because uh, it blocks out the sun and it absorbs the nutrients from the ground. So, you know, you actually have a little bit of a clearing here. And I just, I went out there with no music, no nothing, 
and I just listened to the trees. And I was it was a little bit chilly because it's winter time, but I just went out there and listened for probably about like a half hour. I just stood in the middle of this little forest and listened to the wind in the trees and the sound of things rustling around me and didn't even talk to the trees because that, that's a little weird. Um, I didn't have anything to say to them. I was just there. I was just there. And it was incredibly relaxing. It made me feel like I actually belonged in this place. Um, spending some time with the, the, the earth uh, as as shown in the trees, right? Because the, the, the energy of the earth is, is portrayed in the trees. The, these, these trees just, oh, they're... they're I feel bad for them because they've been basically up, they've gotten the suburban treatment. Well, if we just leave it alone, it'll be okay. So what you have is this massive, you know, plenty of, of dead branches everywhere. Uh, and the trees that, that get up and get out into the sunlight, just get vines that, that come up and choke them out. And then they end up dying and falling over too. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a shame. It's a real shame. Um, and maybe that is natural, but I'm a gardener. I'm, I've appointed myself as gardener of this place, and so I'm going to keep track of it. Anyway, I'm out there ruminating in the air. I'm out there breathing the earth. Which is a weird. That's a weird thing to say, but like breathing as one with the earth and listening to what it has to say. Not that it's going to give me some special words of wisdom, but simply to actually listen and see what it sounds like. See what the trees sound like when the wind goes through them in the winter. To see what the birds sound like. See what, what creatures are rustling through the, the, the snow. And to, to be there and just appreciate it. And just appreciate it. That it is quiet. That frankly, right there, the big problems of the world don't matter. They really don't. And maybe they don't matter as much in my apartment as I thought they did. Maybe I can relax a little bit. Maybe I can stop ruminating on problems that other people have that I can't solve. And I'm never going to meet... Like, people who I'm never going to meet have problems that I could never solve, and I'm thinking about them for them. That's not right. I'm not... It's not even like I'm praying for them. It's like, just here, be worried and frustrated because I'm worried and frustrated. No! I don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of energy. Worry about it yourself. And ask people who are actually close to you who can help you with that solution. Have, ask them for, for help. I'm sick and tired of, of pretending that I need to move my energies in, in vectors that aren't relevant to me. That aren't going to help me or my neighbors. But might someday eventually potentially help an AI somewhere be more efficient. That's not good. That's not right. That's un that's inhuman. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to put my energies toward, you know, I'm not going to going to be sharing data online because it'll feed an algorithm that tells that tries to figure out what I want to see. No. I'm going to keep it to myself and I'm going to think about it. And if I have somebody who's interested in hearing about something, then I will share the information with them. Or if I'm having a conversation with somebody, who's going through something, and I, I can use that wisdom. I will use it. But we are surrounded by noise. We are surrounded by by images, and, and I've gone over that before, but we're surrounded by things, and, and the tools we have at hand are telling us to just be hasty. You know, maybe I've been spending too much time with those trees, but I, I get an Entish mood now. And the Entish mood, frankly, has been... It's been incredibly relaxing. Now, this is not to say that there are not times where you need to just move and stand and act. But in fact, you can't do that if you're if you're drugged, right? When you're when you're on alcohol, you can't you can't run run. You can't you, your your reflexes. There's the word. Your reflexes are numbed when you're on alcohol. When you're on the drugs, you can't think. You can't act. When you when you actually let things when you get in, when you embrace what you got going on, and then when you act you act with deliberation. It is hard to stop a stampeding herd of cattle. The best thing you can do is run. The best thing you can do is run. Or, well, I mean, if it's a true stampede, yeah, you you really can't you can't even hurt them. And if you don't know those cattle, goodness, 
get out of their way. If you know them, hey, you probably know them and well enough to get out of their way. Stop the stop the noise. Cut the cut the cut the cord. Spend some time in some quiet. It, it'll it'll help. The 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 card that I didn't I didn't get to here. As I'm looking to wrap this up, um, the card I didn't get to is well, it's an idea that I had earlier, much, much earlier, and it kind of fed into this about asking. How could I slow down and appreciate what I have? There was a hike that I did about, oh, wow, 10 years ago now. And it was a beautiful hike. And what I remember most about it was when I reached the top of this little section of, of, the, of the hike. It was just gorgeous. I'll have to tell you. I'll, I'll tell you sometime. I'll tell you about it sometime. But... I have a picture of that place that is not the place that I remember. It's not That's not the memory that I have, though. I don't have a picture for the memory that I have of that hike, and I have one picture that I keep um, of the rest of those memories. And, and that, that, for me, is meaningful. Part of me wishes I had done a drawing that I'd sat down for three hours and learned how to draw up there so that I could record this but but not not for this purpose of recording it for the purpose of having an excuse to spend three hours there and do nothing but breathe and so that's my thought that's my thought that I'm going to leave you with and leave you to to do your own podcast effectively to think on to ruminate on the card that I wanted to talk about, well, there you've had the introduction to it, and here it is. When on the trail, draw rather than taking pictures. That's about it. I'm not going to leave you with that. I mean, I do want to close it out because I got a little bit longer left with this piece of music. And so I want to keep, I want to finish it off. It's a great piece of music, and now I'm in a mood, but, but that's it. Why do you need so many pictures? Why do you need so many pictures? Um, the fewer you take, the more you'll remember, if it really matters. And the more you spend time there, the more you'll appreciate what it is. And, and, and it's the things that you can't capture that matter anyway. So what are you doing? When you're out there, maybe, maybe there's wisdom to the sketchbook. Maybe there's wisdom there in appreciating what's out there with time um, rather than being so hasty to capture something that somebody else might appreciate. Stop trying to share the pics. It's not worth it. Share the experience. Share the wisdom. Encourage other people. Yeah, but don't do stuff just because you think other people might like it. Gee whiz. Don't take pictures that you're like, ooh, well, they might like this one. This might get popular. You don't know how much it's affecting your thinking until you actually find it. Trust me. I've been wrestling with this one for a while. Take it because it's a good a good picture. The, the picture on this podcast is not going to be that picture. It's going to be a different picture. Because I'm keeping that picture for myself. I think I've used it elsewhere in a different place, and I've used it elsewhere, and I've, I've put it in different spots. But... but Right. Figure out what it is that you want to ruminate on and ruminate on it. And when you have something before you worth ruminating on, when you've got good meat, don't be in a hurry to eat it. It would be better to let to save it for a time when you have peace than to rush into eating it. And if you don't have time, you don't have time, but seriously make time to take your time. When you're in the presence of people who have good conversation, Free up your time so that you can enjoy it. When you're, when you're out in nature and you have the opportunity to, to chill out and just breathe, take it. Take it because that's good. Because there's, there's beauty there that you can ruminate on. And don't be so quick to think that you've taken everything in. Don't stand on the mountain. Don't stay there. You, gotta, you, gotta, you do have to come back into reality eventually. But 
well, frankly, ruminating is more real than the dreams the dreams that have been taken away from us by our devices, by our haste. The computers simply, you could not have designed a better machine to take away people's dreams. When was the last time you daydreamed? Get back to it. Once you've done that, you'll know you're, you've hit the rumination. Because the daydreaming, the daydreaming is a sign that you're finally awake.